Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Vale Sloan. Well, hello again, everybody. How's that for some walkout music? I need that walking around with me everywhere I go. I am very excited to be kicking off the 2022 Think Tank Shark Tank competition with you right here, right now. This has been a fixture of the Atlas Network calendar for almost 10 years, and we love doing it because it really stands out from so many different programs that we do and, and many other groups. And, and why? Well, it's because we are really encouraging these thought leaders, our network of liberty-minded partners, to come up with new, innovative and impactful ideas to change lives. Now, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, have seen the wildly successful ABC television show Shark Tank. And whilst I'm no Mark Cuban, I can dream, and I love being able to be here and help support this very interesting way in which we get ideas that can seem so simple, but become so impactful. When you look at the Shark Tank TV show, that's what really stands out, isn't it? It's some of the smallest things that really deliver the most success. Think of the scrub daddy, you know, your little dish sponge with a smiley face on it, or my personal favourite, the squatty potty, which really helps with that toilet waste elimination process. These things are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Very simple. It can almost seem deceptively simple. And that's what's interesting and risky about the business world. For many of us, it, it can seem like magic. You, you have an idea, you put it out there, and suddenly you're a millionaire. But so much goes into the strategy, development, marketing, and management of turning an idea into reality. It's not just about the idea, it's about having the team in place to get the job done. Well, in front of you today, you will have three intellectual entrepreneurs from across our network. They have proven track records of success and they have three new ideas on how they can improve and even save lives in their communities. Now, they'll each have only five minutes to pitch their project to our esteemed panel of judges, who will then have five minutes to cross-examine each contestant. And let me tell you, I am a real stickler for that five minutes. Our judges will then determine which project is deserving of not only the 2022 Think Tank Shark Tank prize and award, but they will take home $25,000 in prize money. That's not too bad for 10 minutes' work. Now, before I introduce my judges, I do want to say a very heartfelt thank you and acknowledgement to the Smith Family Foundation for supporting the Think Tank Shark Tank program and Grant Line. Let's give them a round of applause for their generous support. Thank you, Smith Family Foundation. Okay, now I'd like to invite our esteemed judges to the stage. First up, we have Sean Stevenson of the Rising Tide Foundation. Next up, Debbie Gibbs, Atlas Network Chair of the Board of Directors. And finally, Fred Young, an experienced independent investor. Now, don't let those smiles fool you. These judges will put the screws to the contestants and make sure that the best, most impactful prize is awarded to the contestant who is really going to sell what they're doing today. And on that note, let's get started. I'd like to introduce first up Jessie Troyan from the Cardinal Institute of West Virginia pitching her project, The Dignity Project. Welcome, Jessie. Imagine for a moment that you're a single parent and you've just left an unsafe relationship. Now, you're working a new job, getting a little help from the government, but finally regaining that sense of stability. Things are all right. In fact, they're turning up. The boss just told you that he wants to give you a promotion and a raise. Pretty good, right? But there's a catch. You see, this raise is going to make you ineligible for some of the help that you were getting. And worse yet, it's not going to be enough to cover what you lost. You've hit what's known as a benefits cliff. So what do you do? 
Now, I wager a lot of people in this room would keep our nose to the grindstone, but we have to acknowledge that passing on that professional advancement to maintain stability is a rational decision. Scenarios like that bring me to the Cardinal Institute's newest initiative, the Dignity Project, that systematically examines how big government policymaking has systematically fueled social and economic dysfunction, and more so than anywhere else in West Virginia. You see, the legacy of poverty looms large in West Virginia, so much so that the very first modern food stamps were handed out in the southern coal fields. We have a poverty rate that's above 17% and a median household income $15,000 less than the national average. And tying all of this together is the labor force participation rate that has been the lowest in the country since the statistic has been collected. Millions of dollars have been poured into the state by the federal government, and yet we continue to suffer and stagnate. But the Cardinal Institute is on a mission to transform this legacy of poverty into a reputation for opportunity with the Dignity Project. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna partner with our friends at the Georgia Center for Opportunity to collect and model data on these benefit cliffs. We're gonna compile that into research that examines the scope of the problems and proposes solutions. We're gonna take this on a statewide tour to workshop the solutions that we've identified with the people who are actually affected. And then we're gonna tie all of this together with the communications campaign, with a video storytelling feature that sets us up to engage with lawmakers. Out of all of this, what do we have? We have audiences that care, a statewide coalition calling for change, legislative champions, and perhaps most importantly, we are going to reframe the conversation around welfare reform from something that's punitive to something that is focused on reconnecting people to the dignity of earned success through work. But let me be clear, this is a big project. We anticipate 18 to 24 months to do this, $250,000, 150,000 of which we have already raised. But I remind you, these problems in West Virginia have been with us for generations, and it will take a sustained investment like this to tackle with the care and the justice that it deserves. So why should you bet on the Cardinal Institute? To be the group that can turn this tide. Quite simply, we have a reputation for success. Most notably, the Hope Scholarship Program. In the course of about five years, we, our leadership in education policy was able to take West Virginia from a state that enjoyed almost no options in educational freedom to one at the time the law was passed was the most expansive choice program in the nation. And for that, we were honored to be recognized last year as one of the Templeton Freedom Award finalists. We aim high, we win big, and together we can restore dignity to West Virginians by providing them the freedom and the pathway to reach their full potential. Thank you. Well done, Jesse. Thank you for that. We will commence the five minutes of questions with Sean. Sean, do you have a question for Jesse? I, I do, yes, thank you. First, well done. Thank you. <laughs> um, you seem to have laid out a pretty uh, robust plan with a lot of moving parts and a lot of logistics to, to work through, and then there's the politicians. Um, <laughs> what do you see as the biggest challenge to executing in all of these various areas that you're trying to do all at once? So, this is a little bit more, there are pieces to it. There's not quite all of it that goes on at once. It, it's kind of laid out, the process is in about the same way that I laid it out in the presentation. Do the research, mm -hmm. workshop the solutions. It's basically the communications campaign 
and the lawmaker engagement yeah. that occurs simultaneously. Yeah. That's a lot of work. Yeah. Debbie, do you have a question? Um, I do. Thank you for your presentation. It's a fascinating project and I wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you. Um, are you how are you staffing this? Are you going to do all of this work in-house? Do you have, um, you know, is this going to consume the Cardinal Institute in its entirety for the next five years? Or what's the plan in terms of the logistics for staffing and carrying out the work? So I will be the kind of quarterback, if you will, of this research project. But like I mentioned, we have assistance from the Georgia Center for Opportunity. They have done you know, a fantastic job building out this modeling of these benefit cliffs. Um, and we are also working together. We've compiled kind of a panel of experts with other state-based groups in the US, plus a couple of national experts um, to help uh, assist us in this research and to kind of robustness check everything that we're doing to make sure that we're on the right track. Fred, a question from you. Uh, you're taking on the government welfare industry and you're going to need lots of allies and lots of funding. Who are going to be your natural allies and who are you going to recruit in assisting you in this very ambitious effort? So we are primarily looking towards civil society organizations that do a lot of this kind of first line work to help people meet these immediate material needs, whether that's food, that's housing, um, and just other material care. So that is sort of the first place. We're also going to partner with like employment agencies who are working to staff a lot of these different positions and that they are some of the people who see most often uh, the scenarios where it's like, oh, I can't, take this promotion or I can't take on these extra responsibilities in the job because it's gonna render me you know, into a benefits cliff. Any additional questions from our panel of judges? On that note, Jesse, well done. <laughs> All right, thank you very thank much. You. Our second contestant is Sebastian Stodolak from the Warsaw Enterprise Institute in Poland, pitching his project, No Trial, No Prison. Please welcome Sebastian. Feel free to undo it, do whatever. Hello, hi. Don't you think? that if there is no trial, no hard evidence, there should be no prison either. Well, this is Jacek Golinczak, spent 18 months behind bars, and there was no trial. The case is still ongoing. At least now he's walking free. This is Maciej Dobrowolski, over three years behind bars. And it's been 10 years since his detention. <clears throat> the case is still ongoing. At least now he's walking free. And this is a businessman, Lech Jezorne, received a stunning amount of $5,000 as compensation for nine month arrest that had made him bankrupt. In our non-trial, no prison project, we aim at fixing one of the most defunct institutions in Poland, judiciary, by defending its basic principle, presumption of innocence. Mm -hmm. In Poland, this principle is abused to a point that resembles, that resembles the much-hated regime we had before 89. So not only murder suspects, but also people supposedly involved in non-violent crimes, including entrepreneurs, like many of you, are detained without trial and really, really ruins their lives. In Poland now, there's around 8,700 people in pre-trial detention. So it's 70% more than seven years ago. And yet, the, as you see, the number of convicts actually decreased, which implies directly that the system is imprisoning more and more innocents. Also, the longer the duration of pretrial detention, the lower quality of judiciary. In Poland, it's three times as long as in England. Why? Too much politics in prosecutor's offices, too much red tape in the courts, no sound regulation, and uh, no responsibility. We already, 
We already started a campaign against it. We uh, released a report, held an open conference. We published uh, videos about abuse detainees. We published a petition with policy proposals, such as uh, following Finland and limiting free trial arrests only to violent crimes. We presented this uh, petition to Ministry of Justice. Our project has been covered already in over 40 media publications, reaching 5 million people in total. I don't know why the number is not visible here. So, 5 million. We made people realize that the pr problem is real, but that's, of course, not enough. So now we're going to create a watchdog to monitor, publicize cases of abusive arrests and introduce accountability, transparency, and equal treatment to the system. It will put prosecutors and judges in the spotlight in hopes that it will limit their recklessness, of course. So it will also let us dive deeper into the problem, come up with a solution that should fix it once and for all. Our watchdog will be the... Mm, say, conscious of the system, which is now lacking. We'll um, send observers to courts across the country. They will track cases of abusive arrests and publish it on the dedicated website. Then uh, our media team will ensure publication of at least 100 articles in national wide media, plus dozens of TV and radio interviews within a year. And after consulting with uh, best experienced lawyers, we'll draft a holistic ready to implement legislation that should fix it. We'll submit it to the parliament, of course. Warsaw Enterprise Institute that I represent has been advocating for freedom for over eight years. We had our successes in um, positive changes in tax codes, even animal protection laws. And to this project, uh, we built a strong network of professionals, even Polish ombudsman has promised to support it. It will last 12 months. Uh, but, of course, we'd like to run it until the problem is thoroughly solved. So we will fight uh, to find another uh, cooperating institution. So 12 months should be enough to do it. Um, lawyers are crucial to this project. And lawyers are expensive in Poland, too. So, uh, so that's why we uh, already spent $30,000 on it. We'd like to spend another $40,000. Um, yeah, and we need these funds because otherwise it would be very hard to achieve assumed goals. Again, try to put yourself in the shoes of a person that is unjustly detained. Your family's broken, your friends gone, your job's lost. If you had a business, it's already bankrupt, you had to lay off your employees, your private life is crushed totally, your mental health is disintegrated, and you're not alone in this misery. There's thousands like you. The stakes are high and I think it's worth changing. And it's possible to change it, actually. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Sebastian. To kick off the five minutes of cross-examination, let's start with Debbie Gibbs. Thank you, Sebastian. It's a fascinating project and um, obviously a huge issue. Um, so the key output in the end that you're looking for is uh, legislative change, you think that will, will be the prime driver of... Um... There are two outputs we like to fight for. One is the change in the mentality uh, in our prosecutors and judges, which is a very important factor in uh, actually uh, undermining any, uh, any trial. Whenever we try to change the legislation side, there is always this factor uh, prosecutors and judges because they get used to the system so much. So we'd like to change the mentality, but on the other hand, we'd like to prepare, like I said, uh, very detailed legislation that, uh, that would be just ready to implement. Because now we presented uh, proposals which, you know, politicians are lazy. So you have to give them some final product. Next question from Fred Young. You have stated that entrepreneurs are typically the victims of this undue incarceration, which implies that there is a lot of protectionism going on, corruption in the government and uh, with the existing uh, businesses. Do you think that you might overcome that corruption with uh, EU intervention, a la Brussels, uh, in assisting you to, uh, to counter this uh, situation? Well, since this is not a problem limited only to Poland, that might be at least uh, a case for a European-wide discussion. 
but that has to be changed locally, I guess. So with the, from the central, uh, from the central uh, uh, place like Brussels, it would be very hard to, um, you know, propose any really game-changing solutions for a given country. So I don't think a, there was a case for uh, like full-fledged interventions from, from Brussels. It's rather a case for Polish state taking care of its own business. Poland is an outlier apparently in Europe, however. Is that right? In terms of Yes, uh, we are an outlier. The country is with a situation that is worse even. So uh, in the, um, one of the statistics, statistics that I presented, Greece is for example such a country. Of the average pretrial detention as even longer than eight months. So, yes. Thank you. Sean, a question? Yep, thank you. Nice and done. Um, <clears throat> who's going to stop getting paid when you make these changes? Mm. Who's going to stop getting paid? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> it's going to be the government. <sighs> Everyone, everyone. Lawyers, yeah. because the cases will be shorter, right? <laughs> uh, prosecutors, on the other hand, um, they will still be getting paid as much as they are today, but they will not proceed with their careers as fast. Because, you know, uh, this uh, scheme is used for prosecutors to um, lift their professional uh, mm -hmm. position mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So they want to impress people above them by incarcerating as many p people as possible. And that would be impossible uh, after we implement the changes. Okay. And I'm assuming it's sticky economics, uh, since they all work together in the system. <laughs> uh, you're talking about disrupting those economics. And that's why I was asking, who's going to stop getting paid when these changes get implemented? Because it's going to be people who are going to want to protect it and not want to embrace the change that you're trying to create within a system that allows for them to just confiscate somebody's personal belongings and not have to, not have to account for it either. It just kind of disappears. Yes, we want to introduce also some kind of responsibility mm -hmm. for the decisions that are being made in the system, but this is secondary to the like, systematic uh, fundamental changes in legislation. So unless uh, the um, pre-trial arrest length uh, duration is limited to some specific period of time, unless it's limited only to violent crimes, I think that no other incentive mm -hmm. would work to, 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 to fight the problem. Okay, thank you. Any final brief questions from our judges? How many years is this going to take to achieve the reforms? Well, uh, you know, sometimes life could be surprising. I can refer to the other, say, policy win that we, that we had in completely different area. It was related to animal uh, protection shelter animal protection shelter, you know, it was over-regulated in Poland. So Polish um, homeless dogs and cats weren't get uh, the, right, the right treatment in those, uh, in those shelters. Uh, what we do, we actually implemented a very similar uh, campaign as we are doing right now with, uh, with uh, pre-trial arrests. And uh, we succeeded. It got regulated. So sometimes... And that is time, Sebastian. I hate to cut you off, but well done. <laughs> well done, it was a nice <laughs> Okay, our third and final contestant is Luis Fernando Sanabria from the Fundacion Paraguaya with his project, Poverty Stoplight. Please join me in welcoming him. would like to change the way we measure and approach poverty in the world. Uh, we believe that every family can be activated to overcome poverty. We believe that every person can flourish if we allow them to understand how their poverty looks like and to make them aspire to improve their situation. Let's take the example of the smartphone selling in Paraguay, seven out of 10 poor families have a smartphone in my country. And, and why is that? That's because cell phone companies find a way, found a way to capture people's ima imagination. Cell phone, uh, smartphones are good, are cool, are fashion, and gives you access to internet. But not only that, you can also buy it in affordable installment, and you can buy airtime almost in every corner of the country, starting with 50 cents easy to acquire. 
But poverty is a, a, a difficult concept. It's hard to understand. Po families are multidimensionally poor, not only income, but also bathroom, kitchen, environment, many different ways of being poor. Uh, poverty is a kind of great cloud that overwhelms families, and they don't know where to start overcoming. We can also use technology to help them organize that mess. And with drawings and color codes, we can help families map their poverty, as in this sample. Every dot in this picture is one poverty indicator. And once families map it, their situation, they can, they can prepare a plan to overcome it. Not a national development plan, a family plan to overcome poverty. Families can go step by step with mini goals overcoming their deprivation. This is a self-evaluation that families run using an app that we develop. But this information that is bottom up can also inform implementing our organizations. And the purpose of that is for implementing organizations to prepare customized solutions to their beneficiaries. Because every family is poor in its, in its own way. Yeah. And having on one hand, the, on the demand side, the family plan to overcome poverty, and on the offer side, the many of solutions, we link both with a mentor. A mentor that provides information to families for them to take advantage of existing solutions in the territory. And it's working. We have studies that show that we are impacting people's life. And because it's working, we have partners all around the world using the tool. Every partner in every, in every country is adapting the indicators and the tool to their local realities, because poverty is different in, in different parts of the world. We, also, we, we even work with private companies that are using the tool with their workers to improve their workers' their workers' uh, life. If we win this competition, we are going to implement the poverty stoplight in the semi-desertic Chaco region in Paraguay with the with the Com indigenous people, native people there. The, the budget, uh, the process is is quite simple. It starts with a self-evaluation that family does using the the app in smartphones or, or tablets, then families develop their family plan to overcome, overcome poverty. Mentors men, mentor them to access to existing solutions in the territory, and we apply a follow-up uh, survey after a year. And by comparing the, the baseline, baseline self-evaluation and the follow-up survey, we measure the impact of, of the project. Uh, the budget is going to be spent mostly uh, to hire social workers that uh, will work as, men, as mentors of, of the families. And, and, and we have seen this happen. We have seen people levitating out of poverty, as, as this lady that sold her bathroom situation in four months, or this one that sold her teeth situation in six months. No. So the final goal of this project is to change more red and yellows into green, 900 in total. So we can, family by family, start creating a world without poverty where we all want to live. Thank you very much. Well done, Luis. And to kick off our final round of questions, Fred, why don't you ask the first? Uh, your program depends upon mentors, mentors working one-on-one -on -one with families. You've indicated that the poverty rate is enormous, so you're going to have to be able to approach literally millions of families. How will you successfully recruit such a large number of mentors to be able to reach these millions of families? Well, it depends on the community. We are working in some community with mentors that we hire, but in other communities, we use local leaders as mentors. And we are also uh, starting to develop the do-it-yourself do version using technology as mentors. The iPhones and the social media? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. You can download the, even the app and try it in App Store or, in, or for, for the, in Is Isabel. there a high literacy rate among that target audience of poor people? Sorry? Is there a high literacy rate? Will they be able to read the, the apps? Do they understand how to use yes, the yes. technology? Yes, because we, have, we use drawings and pictures to better explain every indicator. 
And in Paraguay, most of the people are illiterate people, but all of them has a, fa a Facebook account, an Instagram account. <laughs> Thank you. Sean, a question from you. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge you need to overcome uh, to be able to achieve that dream of, of making it a place where we all want to live? Well, the challenge, the challenge is that we develop a uh, technology that is powerful enough to inspire people you know, and to replace mentors, because this is, uh, this is the challenge to find the right mentors. Some, uh, you, do, you know, there are those, um, those apps to lose weight, mm -hmm. and some people lose weight using, using the app. But other people, as my wife, she needs a mentor. <laughs> she needs a personal training <laughs> trainer to, to lose weight. <laughs> and, and like that, we, they're, they're, they're um, Your wife's not here, is she? <laughs> <laughs> no, she's not here. That's why I'm making You know, there, there are going to be um, communities where uh, the digital mentorship would be enough. But there are communities that are really, really very poor, extremely poor, that you, you need a, a mentor in the field working with them. Debbie, a question from you. Are there um, cultural differences that, that you will need to address with this specific community that you're um, targeting this project to? Not really, not really, you know. Uh, we, because we did adapt the tool in our country in Paraguay for, different, for the different type of, of communities. But uh, as I mentioned before, you have to adapt the tool to your local environment. So the, the version of the stoplight we have in Paraguay is very different from the one we have here in the US or in Tanzania. For example, potable water definition in my country is very different uh, of potable, uh, of drinking water definition in Tanzania. Because one of the key aspects of our methodology is that the, the, the green have to be achievable by family. It's the only way they can aspire to reach the green. And have you, have you found the app to be more, um, where, where has it been most impactful and successful where it's been utilized around the world? Uh, well, we work a lot with micro entrepreneurs and it's very successful with micro entrepreneurs, maybe because of their condition, because they are more proactive compared to other people. No. Uh, Judges, any final brief questions? Do you expect political support from the government for the programs that you uh, are embarking upon? No, no. We only need... <laughs> we, <laughs> the, the only thing we need uh, is the government do not bother us <laughs> on doing this. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any final questions, judges? Satisfied. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Thank Luis. You very much. Well done. Congratulations. Well done. Well, Jesse, Sebastian, and Luis have all swam with the sharks, and I think they did a bloody good job. So, a round of applause for all of our contestants here. But of course, there can only be one winner, and on that note, our judges. Sean, Debbie, and Fred, thank you so much for your help. Our colleague at Atlas Network, Hunter Rausch, will now be taking you to a very secure location in which to conduct your deliberations and decide on the winner of the Think Tank Shark Tank. Please join me in thanking our judges for their work today. are going to welcome back up to the stage everybody's favorite Aussie, Vale Sloan, to give you the answer to the question that I know has been weighing heavily on your minds since lunch today. Who won the 2022 Think Tank Shark Tank competition? So please come on up, Vale. Thanks, Alex. We couldn't let you all off the hook that easily and let you know who won straight away. We had to wait till dinner, late in the program. But, you know, it was three astounding projects we heard today. Jesse Troyan of the Cardinal Institute with the Dignity Project, Sebastian Stodolak from the Warsaw Enterprise Institute in Poland for their project, No Trial, No Prison, 
And finally, Luis Fernando Sanabria from Fundacion Paraguaya on their Poverty Stoplight Project. Now, this ain't my first rodeo, but I gotta say, those were some brilliant projects. So a round of applause for all three once more. Good job, good job. Now, I don't know about you, but I sure did not envy the job of our three judges in having to pick one winner for the $25,000 prize. But they did their duty, and we indeed have a winner. A project grounded in these classical liberal ideas to lift people up and give them new hope and new opportunity. So here, in my fancy jacket, I have an envelope with the answer that we've all been waiting for. Can I get a drum roll, please? The winner, ladies and gentlemen, is Fundacion Paraguaya, Luis Fernando Sanabria for Poverty Spotlight. Come on up, Luis, let's get a photo, mate. Come on up. <laughs> Luis, astounding job, my friend. We're looking forward to this photo and uh, special recognition to your wife for her part in your speech. <laughs> All right, congratulations, Luis, and another big round of applause for our fantastic Shark Tank finalists.